Um, so let's get started. We're at 702. Um, thank you all for joining us on this Thursday evening. Um, first, I'm going to invite uh, or introduce um, our panelists who we have. So only a few of us will be making a presentation today, but we have a number of people who are on our panel to help answer questions. So um, let me get started. So we have Samantha Woods from the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, we have Steve Hurley from the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Sandra Shaw from Interfluve, which is a consulting group. Michelle Craddock, Craddock from DEP. Becky Coletta, who is our Indian Head River Restoration Steering Committee representative for the town of Pembroke. Chris Hirsch from DER. Uh, James Gardner, who is a PhD student who's done a, some, a good amount of research in the Indian Head River, um, looking at the fisheries. Um, let's see, Sandra, I have you twice. Warren Winders from Trout Unlimited. Um, we've got Nick Nelson, also from Interfluve, and Steve Camito, who is our, um, our Hanover representative on the Indian Head River. Um, steering committee give me one second i'm sorry just looking at i think that is everybody okay. i think that those other two people are people i invited so that's neil and melissa i see okay great um great so i'm gonna get started so um again thank you all for joining us um i'm gonna speak for a few minutes i'm gonna um well, actually, who am I? I'm Becky Malamit. I'm the River Restoration Quarter Coordinator for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, and I've been looking at this Indian Head River Restoration Project for the last few months. Um, and our goal today is to provide some information. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is some background on dams and the dam removal process and the river restoration. Um, and I try to help um, people get a sense of the background and the, the for this project. And um, it's a presentation that I've done for some boards and committees in the Han towns of Hanover, Hanson, and Pembroke. So some of the, if, if you have attended any of those meetings or seen them any online, some of the content will sound familiar. Um, Michelle Craddock is going to talk a little bit about the funding for this phase of the project. And then Sandra Shaw is going to um, speak to um, the really the nuts and bolts in the project. So they're the consultants who have signed on to, or we've contracted to do the feasibility study and conceptual design. Um, so she'll talk about some of their past work and talk about what this project really will look like. Um, before we get started, I wanted to start with a poll. Um, so this is specific, let me back up a little bit. You know, we're looking at potential removal of Ledham's Ford Dam um, and the State Street Cross Street Dam. Ledham's Ford Dam kind of creates a boundary between Hanover um, and Pembroke and the, the two towns are the owners of that dam. Similar situation in um, for the State Street Cross Street Dam, which is the border of Hanover and Hanson, and the dam is owned by those two towns. So our goal was really to bring in as many people from those three towns into this session so we can start to provide that background, but I want to get a sense of where everybody is from. So I'm going to launch the first poll, which is which town you live in, if you're in Hanover, Hanson, Pembroke, and if you're in a different town, if you could just add that into the Q&A box um, so we can have a sense of where people are from. So great. Like kind of evens. Yeah, really give them. <laughs> I love these polls. And uh, if you are from a different town, please write it in. Yeah, the the Q and A would be great. We, that'll be recorded for us. Yeah, so it looks pretty even. Twenty five percent Hanover, twenty percent Hanson, eighteen percent Pembroke. So excellent. Um, We've got a few people who are putting their question, their answers in the Q&A. Oh, great. We've got Citruit, Norwell, Marshfield, Hingham, Plymouth, Weymouth. So, Hing yeah, most of those are the ones I see here so far. Excellent. Well, great. We appreciate you all spending time to learn some more about this project. Um, and before I get started, too, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, so questions can be submitted through the Q&A box. Um, I would request that you might hold on until after the presentations to submit your questions on the off chance that we answer your question during the presentation. Um, and then we will be kind of calling all of those questions and um, you know, grouping any that have similar um, content together. And then we'll go through those at the end. 
Um, so let's get started. I'm going to close. I'm going to end the poll. Can I ask a question back? Yeah. To start. Um, so Ken Reback was just telling telling me he was here. Did he? Was he supposed to be a panelist? No. Not that I know of. No. He's um, certainly knowledgeable. So I'm glad you're here, Ken. <laughs> He's a, a retired Division Marine Fisheries uh, biologist who worked oh. on, on the Indian Head. Okay. Bit. He was. Um, yes quite knowledgeable but so he's here so he can um yeah i can put him if he might have some information for people based on their questions so let me get him in there okay you can switch his yeah switch him oh all right ken <laughs> and then once i see him you can come on this it. side of the <laughs> webinar <laughs> if you can't i'm sure yeah i've got him okay great okay great Yes. Okay. Excellent. Chris is having a hard time hearing me. Chris is having a hard time hearing me. Uh, he says, Chris Hirsch is saying, I'm having a hard time hearing you. You're very muted. Do you hear me now? Was it just because I wasn't very loud? You, Sam, yeah. Better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fabulous. Okay. Just want to make sure we're all able to communicate. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. So let's get started here. Okay. okay, so I, as I mentioned, um, we're talking about the Indian Head River Restoration Project. Um, and I wanted to just start by talking about some basic information about dams and giving everyone some um, perspective of these two dams that we're talking about here. So the top two pictures show Ludham's Ford Dam. You know, dams are structures that are built across a re river or stream to hold the water back. Um, so the top two pictures are Ludham's Ford. The bottom two pictures are the State Street Cross Street Dam. So you can see the really different looking um, dams. The top one, Ludham's Ford, is a concrete dam with a fish ladder that comes through the center of it. And the State Street Cross Street Dam, you can see a little bit better in the bottom right picture, is really a series of rocks and boulders that have been strewn across the river. Um, they both had the same purpose initially, which was to provide power to the industries along the river. Um, some other purposes of dams would be for flood control, um, for recreation, as well as for storage for um, human and um, livestock or agricultural needs. Um, so these are just two of over 3,000 dams in Massachusetts, and you can see from this map here, they're spread all over uh, the state. Currently, about 40 or so are used for flood control, another 40 or so are licensed hydropower dams, and another 100 or so are used as uh, reservoirs. So that leaves another 2,800 or so that are in the same boat as these two dams we're talking about tonight, in that they are not don't really serve much of a purpose anymore. Um, once the industries that those bands, a lot of those dams were built to support have left um, and are no longer in use and therefore no longer need that power, we're left with the negative impacts of the dams on the rivers themselves. Um, so as you can see here, that gray bar is the dam. Um, and once you put a dam in a river, it basically turns that river into a series of ponds. Um, and that can lead to increased temperatures, especially in the warmer months and increased temperatures um, can lead to less oxygen, more algae, um, and therefore make it a difficult place for plants and animals to live. Also, a lot of our river fish need cold water to live. And once that, that water becomes too warm, they no longer can live in it. Um, it also blocks fish passage. You can see the fish on the right here in this slide um, are no, no longer able to get upstream. So we have our anadromous fish, like our herring and our shad, that need to go from the ocean upstream in the river to their spawning habitat, and the dam blocks that passage. And then you also have our eels and our, our brook trout in the Indian Head River that would just use the river for passage, general passage, and can no longer do that. Um, another issue is trapping sediment and nutrients behind the dam. So you can see that as the yellow bar um, to the left of the, the, the gray dam here. 
And that covers the riverbed and that riverbed can be used as habitat. And once it's covered by sediment, it's no longer a viable option. Um, and also if there's any contamination trapped in that sediment, it will increase the contamination, the concentration of that contaminant in the water body itself. And that water body behind the dam is called an impoundment. Those are the ponds that we see at Ludham's Ford Park and the pond that we see upstream of the State Street Dam. Um, so we're looking at, at restoring and reconnecting the stretch of river, again, because these dams were built to support industries that no longer exist. And so some of the benefits of the river restoration projects are restoring those ecosystem functions that I just mentioned, as well as restoring the river herring spawning habitat, helping to bring those species back. Um, the cultural values of the herring run, herring have been a staple food for indigenous people and for or early settlers. Um, and the herring run, you know, is almost non-existent at these areas. Um, so removing the dam and restoring the river will bring that back. Also eliminating liability for towns and private dam owners. So in this case, as I mentioned earlier, the, the towns own these dams. So Hanover and Pembroke own Ludham's Ford Dam. Hanover and Hanson own the State Street Cross Street Dam. Any damages that could result from a breach of these dam dams would be the, on the towns to pay for. Um, so these dams, you know, they certainly were not engineered to today's standards and certainly weren't engineered to today's um, weather patterns. Um, so the risk of breach just gets it increases more and more. Um, and, you know, at the State Street Cross Street Dam already has kind of two areas that have breached. Um, so, you know, a full breach. Is there's certainly potential for a full breach. And again, the towns would be liable for any of those damages. Um, and then also climate change resilience, as I mentioned before, you know, our weather patterns are significantly different. We're seeing lots more flooding, more severe storms, and the ability of the, and the dams just don't have, won't have the ability to absorb those impacts long-term. And again, any, any damages that would result from those um, breaches would be on the, 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 the towns to pay for. Um, so the dam removal process has four stages. Uh, first was a reconnaissance study, which was completed about a year ago. This looks at generally available data. Um, there was some sediment sampling done, and it really creates a path forward um, for the next step, which is the feasibility study. So that's the stage we're now in the very early stages of it. Um, and this feasibility study is going to look at... Um, the potential impacts to um, the infrastructure, both upstream and downstream of these dams, how it will impact those bridges, um, and what additional um, uh, uh, steps might need to be made, be made to be to protect them. It's going to uh, uh, look at a much larger sediment sampling program, and that's going to allow us to come up with a sediment management plan, um, which will help us understand the levels of contamination and how to safely remove the sediment. We'll do what's called a hydrologic and hydraulic survey in each and each study, which will look at how the water levels will change, how velocities might change. From there, we'll get some um, renderings. So we'll get a sense of how this might look after the study is complete. We'll do a, an in-depth historical analysis and historical review as well as part of this stage. Um, and we'll do some more, some more mapping and surveying of the area. Um, once that's complete, we would move into design, engineering, and permitting, and then construction. And those last two steps I think will be significantly different for both of these projects because as you saw on that first slide they're very different um, different dams um, and will be much one will be much more involved process than the other. Um, so this is the timeline for the feasibility study. We just selected our project engineers. I mentioned Interflu uh, uh, earlier. Um, we're doing this public information session. So this is the first time we've had the general public come together to learn about the project. Um, for the last few months, I've been, as I mentioned earlier, reaching out to boards and committees, sharing this type of information. And, and the goal is to continue to do more of that over the spring and summer months. Um, something else you can put into the chat as well would be if there are any organizations or groups that you think why, why should we should be talking to directly, um, you know, the more people we can reach out to, the better. Uh, our goal is to have the study completed at the end of September. And at that point, we'll do a whole nother round of outreach to help inform the towns about what the study found. And um, the goal would be for the towns to then make a decision about whether or not to remove the dams in early 2024. Um, that will either be done by select boards or it will be a, through a town meeting. I think that will be on the select boards to decide. Um, but again, our goal is just to inform everybody. Um, we'll have another info session like this, a larger public info session, hopefully in person. Um, we'll be doing more outreach to boards and committees and again, more outreach to um, directly to organizations and through community events. 
Um, so I'm now going to pass it on to Michelle Craddock, who is from DEP, and she is going to talk about the funding stream for this phase of the project. Thanks so much, Becky. Um, so as Becky said, my name is Michelle Craddock, and I coordinate the Natural Resource Damages Assessment and Restoration Program at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Um, the NRD program provided um, funding for this phase of the project. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick background on the program and where the funds came from. So natural resource damages assessment and restoration is the process of assessing injuries to natural resources resulting from spills and releases of oil and hazardous materials into the environment. Uh, we can then bring claims against responsible parties um, to collect monetary damages to compensate the public for these injuries to natural resources. We then uh, plan and implement projects to restore, replace, or acquire the equivalent of those natural resources and the services they provide uh, to the environment and the public. Uh, this process um, can be performed by natural resource trustees for state, federal, and tribal governments. For the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the Secretary of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs is the state's uh, natural resource trustee, um, but MassDEP administers the program on her behalf. Next slide. So MassDEP received $6.9 million in bankruptcy funds to restore natural resources injured by the former National Fireworks Site in Hanover. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, some of the injured natural resources from that site include sediment, surface water, fisheries, aquatic life, and fish consumption advisories. Um, these bankruptcy funds that we received are separate from the funds that are being used to clean up the fireworks site and can be only used towards restoration projects that benefit those injured natural resources that I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, currently, uh, MassDEP is in the restoration planning phase of the NRDAR process, um, and as part of that, we awarded a grant to the North-South Rivers Watershed Association to conduct feasibility studies on the potential removal of these two dams on the Indian Head River. Um, it has a close nexus to the injured natural resources and would provide significant benefits to those resources. Um, I'm going to stop here, but uh, my contact info is on the slide. I'm happy to answer any questions later on in the presentation or feel free to email me as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So before we move on to Sandra's presentation, I want to do one more poll. Um, I want to ask now that you have some background of the area of the river that we're looking at. Um, I want to do one more poll and get a sense of how people use the river. So let me share that. Here we go. There we go. Everybody see that? How do you use a river? So I've got some options here. Enjoy the view, fishing, kayak, canoe, or paddleboard, walking the trails. Other, please feel free to send it in the chat um, so we can get a sense of what other ways people are using this resource. And then if none, and you're just here for information and you don't actually use it, feel free to enter that as well. So walk the trail seems to be the biggest so far. Walk the trails and enjoying the view. Similar responses. Fishing and kayaking, also similar responses. Yeah, so we have about um, 38 or you know about 40 at enjoying the view, but 43 walk the trails. 32 canoe, kayak, or paddleboard, 30 fishing. Other, Sammy, seeing any um, other uses in the chat there? Let me take a look. Uh, somebody says swimming. Mm. Mm -hmm. And one person was having trouble seeing the options. I'm not sure mm. we can help her. How much of the 6.9 has DEP given? $410,000 is the is the amount of this so not, not. Okay. sleeping rocks <laughs> oh that's a good one 
somebody said the chat is disabled, but I. The Q and A, maybe look for the Q and A on the yeah. bottom. I won't say chat. She was able to tell me the chat is disabled through the Q and A, so. Oh, okay. Okay, great, thanks for those responses. Um, somebody said subsistence. Another person said the river is on their property, so. Great. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Sandra Schott from Interflu, who's going to talk about uh, their work on the project. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. All right. Um, you're just seeing the first slide, correct? Yeah, we see the first slide. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for all being here and for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association for moving this project forward. My name is Sandra Shaw and I'm an engineer at Interfluve. I'll be the project manager for our team. Um, so just so you know what you're getting into, um, first I'll give an overview of our team, then I'll walk through our approach to the project, and then I'll give some examples of past dam removal projects we've worked on. Um, this image is of the Whittenton Dam mill on the Mill River in Taunton, Mass, and it's three months after the removal of the dam. So our team includes Interfluve, Horsley Witten, the Herring Pond Tribe, and PAL, um, the Public Archaeology Laboratory. Um, Interfluve is a, wetland, a river and wetland restoration firm that focuses on geomorphically and eco, eco, ecologically sound design solutions. Um, Horsley Witten is an engineering, planning, and environmental consulting firm uh, PAL is a team of archaeologists and historians who perform historic archaeology surveys, and the Herring Pond Tribe is a tribal community who are one of the remaining historic tribes in Massachusetts, um, and they continue to protect cultural heritage and historical lands for their ancestors, children, and future descendants. So, uh, like Becky said, we're in the very early stages of the dam removal process. So. Um, we are currently um, in the feasibility study and preliminary designs. Um, so our work in this phase is to evaluate the feasibility for fish, fish passage and dam removal for the Ludham's Ford and State Street Cross Street dams with the goal of improving aquatic habitat connectivity, restoring fluvial processes, reducing dam owner liability, and maintaining and enhancing recreational access and opportunities. We'll develop concept renderings and 40% design drawings. So here you see all the different disciplines that go into river restoration and dam removal. Um, proficiency at river restoration requires a wide range of knowledge as each field itself could require a lifetime of learning. The expertise in all these fields shown here are going into this project. And there are many more disciplines that might come up for any particular other project. For folks who don't know what geomorphology is, it's the study of landscapes and how they change. Um, so the first step in understanding the river at the dam site is to learn about the watershed characteristics and the historical changes that have occurred along the river. Depending on the age of the dam, there's often useful information to be gleaned from a small amount of research online. Older topographic maps showing floodplain surfaces are usually available via the web. And then the next step is going to the site. We'll investigate upstream and downstream of both dams for hints of the historical channel. For instance, stumps in the impoundment can indicate the former, former floodplain location. We'll collect a variety of data such as bed and bank material and vegetation composition, complete a topographic and bathymetric survey, and consider possible 
dam removal alternatives, challenges to removal, and possible opportunities afforded to the site by the site. We'll also survey the dams themselves, bridges, buildings, and other nearby infrastructure that might be impacted by the dam removals. You'll see the State Street Cross Street Bridge here on the left. Um, we'll analyze the bridge under existing and proposed conditions for scour potential. The scour analysis will help inform the design requirements for stabilization around this infrastructure. Um, and if further structural or geotechnical evaluations are identified as necessary, those will be added to the next phase of design. Um, the other two images are some of our past projects where there were crossings near the dam removal sites. Another facet of our study that Becky mentioned before um, are the hydrology and hydraulics in current condition and the condition where the dams are removed. Understanding the hydrological conditions of the river, including the magnitude and seasonal variability of flows and the hydraulic capacity of the river to erode the reservoir sediment are important to analyze the rate of scour, deposition, and river channel evolution in the former reservoir area and downstream of the channel. We will also look at the, at the climate change effects on hydrology and incorporate that into our analyses. With our hydraulic model, we'll ask questions such as, what will the impact of dam removal on flood levels and the water surface profile be? What will fish, mig fish passage conditions be after dam removal during migration periods? What are the anticipated hydraulic effects of dam removal on crossings and bridges? How far upstream will the hydraulic effects of dam removal extend? How would dam removal impact private property along the impoundment? What would the post removal hydraulic conditions at the former dam site be? And what design velocities and shear stresses should be used to design particular elements of the project, such as bank treatments? The next subtask is characterizing the sediment. Um, so, characterizing the sediment. Uh, accumulated behind the dam helps us understand the level of management needed. This is particularly true along the Indian Head River, where the upstream National Fireworks Superfund site and related historical contaminant sources have led to documented conditions of elevated metal, metals in the subject impoundments, as well as potential for other contaminants of concern. We'll be sampling sediment in several locations upstream and downstream of the dams and send in those samples for a laboratory analysis to identify the potential for contamination and identify targeted compounds for possible additional testing in the future. We will also estimate the volume of sediment and type of underlying native material with a depth of refusal survey. We can often identify the historical channel location by hitting rock or gravel or sand and locate the historical floodplain by hitting a higher elevation surface consisting of soils such as loamy sand or compacted organics. This survey provides information to build the topographic sur surface of the historical channel and floodplain. So how sediment will be managed will largely be de determined by the contaminant characteristics of those mobile sediments and the potential quantity and quality impacts to downstream resources from release of those sediments. Physical removal of accumulated sediment as part of a restoration plan will require permitting through the Mass DEP and sediment testing in accordance with Mass DEP requirements. In passive sediment management, there is no removal of sediment behind the dam, and instead we let the river take the sediment downstream. While there is limited predictability and a need to consider upstream and downstream infrastructure, it's less work, less expensive, and we let the river form habitat on its own. In active sediment management, on the other hand, the sediment behind the dam needs to be excavated out and hauled somewhere. There's active channel construction and more design and engineering needed, 
and it can be one of the more costly pieces of a dam removal project. But the pros of active removal include instant habitat and species specific complex habitat that we would build. We've had projects where there was a combination of passive and active sediment management, and we've had projects where there needed to be an active sediment removal, but some of the sediment could be reused on site and some of the sediment needed to be disposed of in a specific way due to certain contaminants. And the last subtask of our work will be the design, engineering, rendering, and cost. From all this work, we'll produce preliminary designs for both the State Street, Cross Street, and Ludham's Ford, Ford, Ford dams. We'll write a report and develop an engineer's opinion of probable construction costs. We'll also develop cost estimates for future dam maintenance and repair so the dam owners understand, understand future costs should they decide not to pursue dam removal. We'll also create an artistic rendering of each site so stakeholders can visualize post-construction conditions. The rendering that you see here shows the site where a dam was, dam was removed at three different seasonal flows. And the image on the bottom left is an example of a typical detail that we would design to show the reconstruction of a river channel where a dam was removed. So now I'll go into some case studies of dams that we've removed um, thus far um, at Interfluve. So here is the Mill River in Taunton, Massachusetts. Um, and we removed three dams on this river, the Whittington Dam, West Britannia, and the Hopewell Mills Dam. Um, the removal of the three dams along the Mill River began in two, 2007, um, and there's ongoing monitoring today. The dams were removed in 2012, 2014, and 2018, with this decade plus restoration effort being an indicator of some of the challenges we've experienced. Um, similar, to, uh, similar to the Indian Head River, the dams were owned by different entities. There was impounded sediment that had varying levels of contamination, um, and elements of the project sites were identified as having historical value. Um, and downstream bridge infrastructure had to be evaluated for stability with the removal of the dams. This is the Hopewell Mill site, um, and this is the impoundment before dam removal. And then this is what it looks like post dam removal um, in 2021. There were 14,000 cubic yards of impounded sediment at the Hopewell Mills Dam. And this is an image of during construction where there was active sediment removal and um, channel construction. And this is the river three years after construction. Um, the first migratory season after the removal of Hopewell Mills Dam, there was the return of fish and um, eel to the site. Um, and then this is West Britannia Dam, um, also on the Mill River after, um, this image is after dam removal. And the first migratory season after dam removal, they saw 400 herring um, on the fish camera that they installed. This is the Whittington Mills Dam. Um, on the left is um, pre-dam removal, on the right is post-dam removal. And here are some images throughout the years of, of the river. Um, so 2010, the dam was still in. 2014 is a few months after construction. In 2018, you'll see a bunch of vegetation has grown in and the river has established itself. Um, the Marlin Place um, Dam is on the Shaw or was on the Shawshine River in Andover. Um, there is some contaminated sediment um, on this river, and um, it it's a historic. It was a historic dam, and there are building structures on both sides of the dam, so access was really tough for this one. Um, this is looking upstream after dam removal. This is pre-construction looking downstream 
Um, and then this is during construction, also looking downstream. And then this is in 2019, looking downstream. And then this is this pot or last winter in 2022. And that's all I have. Um, thank you so much for listening and feel free to ask any questions. Great, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. So yeah, if you have questions, put them into the Q&A, please, and we we'll, can address them uh, directly. Um, and, you know, the goal here tonight was is to provide a lot of information. You realize it is a lot of information, um, but this won't be the last time that we'll have an opportunity to um, share your feedback and share your questions. Um, I will give my email address at the end. It's just, I'll give it now, becky at nsrwa.org. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, my goal is over the next few months to do a lot more outreach um, and also to do some walks and some site visits, not only to the two sites that we're talking about now, but also to other areas on the South Shore that where we've um, removed dams, reconnected river, so that people who are interested can get a sense of what it looks like in person, start to ask questions um, of residents, people maybe who lived along the impoundments, um, talk with other select boards and other community members who might be able to share their experience. So our goal is really to make as many connections as we can um, in advance of the, the study being complete in September. So we do have a couple of questions that Great. I can try to field for and maybe ask some of our panelists to, to provide the answers for. Great. So one of the questions, um, is about sediment removal. So probably um, more question maybe for Sandra. Um, is sediment removal a normal part of dam removal, especially if removal of a dam will increase the sedimentation on pools downriver affecting boating? Um, so Sandra, do you wanna take a crack at it? I could also try. I guess I could do a, a, a quick just, um, all dams are different. <laughs> uh, that's why you need to have studies done. Um, but we have removed three dams on the third Herring Brook in Hanover and Norwell. And at that point, um, you know, the sediment was allowed to be passively released downstream. Um, and to some extent, that's a good thing because the sediment has been deprived of being mobile and being mobilized and allowed to go downstream. So we have what's called sediment starved stream beds downstream. So, um, but we have to evaluate it carefully. And we have to make sure the sediments are clean and uh, that they wouldn't be an overwhelming amount of sediment. So that's part, I think, of what Sandra and her team's task will be. But Sandra, uh, Sandra, maybe you'd like to um, chime in here. That was a great answer. Um, I actually think that Chris Hirsch from DR might be a good person to speak to this since he is the dam removal person at DER. So was, do you have anything to add to what Samantha said? Sure, yeah. Um, I would completely echo every dam is different and each one has unique conditions, both upstream and downstream. Um, specifically the navigability, that's something that's gonna be considered um, during the chapter 91 permitting process. Chapter 91 looks very extensively at navigability of water and the impacts of your project may or may not have on that. Um, so that is something that will be considered um, as part of this project through that process. Mm -hmm. but, I'll just uh, add to that, yeah. that the, this current phase of the project, is, we're not into permitting quite yet, but it's definitely something that we'll be thinking about when we work through our designs. So well, yeah, part of what uh, Sandra's team will do is provide us, as I said, both a qualitative and quantitative. That is how, what's the quality of that sediment and how much is there? And then they'll do use that along with um, hydrologic analysis to see how that would distribute downstream um, if it was allowed to be removed. My thought is that because that we know there's probably some contamination here, there might be more active management of that sediment. 
So, but those are things we're going to discover um, through this process and um, be able to come back and, and give you more information after the summer. So next question that was brought up by Skip Baluisi is what will be the cost to Hanover and Pembroke towns for the removal of the dam at Ludham's Ford? question will the lawsuit fund pay for it question or is there only enough money for pa for passive rebuild um so i'll try to take a crack at that um our goal is to use as much of of other people's money <laughs> as, as possible <laughs> including this natural resource damages trust fund that being said there are a lot of other resources available both federally and state to um, to help pay for things that would be beneficial e to the ecology of this river. Um, so while I'm not saying that Hanover and Pembroke wouldn't pay for some portion of it, um, we would try to uh, leverage the resources of the Natural Resource Damages Trust Fund as much as possible um, if, the, if dam removal is the chosen uh, pathway forward. Um, as I said, lots of resources available because the federal government and the state government would like to see the natural ecology restored, particularly as it pertains to anadromous fish like herring, river herring, shad, eels, um, all of which, and brook trout, all of which live within the system and could potentially benefit from this dam removal or dam removals. Um, so, so we don't know how much this is gonna cost yet. That's what this process is gonna discover for us. And so as we are able to understand better the quality and quantity of the sediments, um, other issues that the team is gonna be reviewing as an engineering team, then we'll get a better, uh, at every step along the way, they refine the cost um, of what it might cost to do this project. Um, so we don't know if there's enough money for, <laughs> I suspect that there is uh, many dams, we, could be anywhere from 500,000 to 2 million. Um, but these are just, you know, until we get a design and, and a better understanding, we're just guessing, which is why we, we have to have engineers help us to look at some of these resources. Other thoughts from any of the other panelists about costs yet at this early stage? I don't have any input on costs, but I just wanted to say, yes, like brief kind of thing about the NRD trust account that we have. Um, I would say at this time, we've committed to funding this feasibility phase. You know, we um, still need to go to, in order to spend additional funds, we would need to go through, you know, a more thorough kind of restoration planning process that would involve a lot of um, public meetings, public outreach, public input on what projects we were going to fund. So that would still um, need to happen, um, you know, that said, um, you know, this, this project has a lot of great benefits um, in terms of the Indian Head River and the resources that were impacted. Um, so, you know, there's potential for these funds to, you know, further go towards this project if it does move forward. Um, but again, we love to see projects leveraged and leveraged funds. Um, this would be, you know, great opportunity for other grant funding um, so that we can, you know, use the NRD trust funds to fund as many restoration projects in the watershed as possible. So that, that would be our goal, it would be the most um, impactful restoration as well as the most restoration that we can do in the watershed with our funds. Any other panelists have any comments on costs at this stage that didn't get covered? Okay. Yeah, I would just echo Michelle's um, commentary. You know, as a watershed association, we would really love to see the six point, I think it's 6.9 million uh, used for many, many projects. And so we are gonna do our best to try to get as many partners to the table for for this if this goes through or any other projects because we would like to really extend the um the restoration effort as much as possible um another question was is interflu's work being paid for by the four hundred and ten thousand that the nsrwa received as the grant yes they are so they're subcontracted to to us um when the next info session will be, will probably be in the fall. Um, that's, I think, what our goal is, is for the 
team to do some of the engineering uh, field work um, and then come back to the public uh, as well as decision makers and committee members and anybody else who'd like us to come speak with them um, and present what the findings of the studies have been. So that can help inform decision making. Somebody asked, how much impact on brook trout populations do we anticipate? Uh, I'm not sure who might be the best to- I, I can answer that. Uh, yes. So basically there's uh, two types of uh, brook trout in the river. There's the stocked brook trout, which are actually coming on Monday. We have a load of um, hatchery trout that's gonna be stocked for recreational opportunities in the river. Uh, but the primary impact will be on the wild brook trout that are found in uh, numerous tributaries of the Indian Head River. And based on what we've seen in other dam removals, the wild brook trout will colonize the main river uh, when conditions are suitable. After we removed the Tack Factory Dam up at Third Herring Brook, uh, the wild brook trout came out of the tributaries and were found in the main stem uh, quite a bit in the spring. And the same thing happened in the Jones River with the Elm Street Dam removal. The, wild brook trout would come out of the tributaries and utilize that main stem. So overall, this will be a very beneficial uh, project to the native brook trout of the area. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, can people hear me? Okay. <laughs> One of the comments was that I was still a little soft, so I, I'll try to make sure that I'm speaking as loud. I hope it's not my uh, equipment. Um, all right, so another question was, can the removal of dams negatively impact the wildlife that has made the Indian Head River home, such as turtles, muskrats, migrating ducks, frogs, great blue herons? Great question, Marilyn. Um, anybody wanna take a crack at that? I'll take that on uh, since it's part of our agency, Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, basically, whenever you change the habitats, different species will utilize it. Uh, but in general, the dam removals will be beneficial will allow these species to migrate up and down the river and find suitable habitats. Um, and with increased anadromous fish, it might benefit uh, the predatory birds like the great blue heron. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, um, and can, can I chime in on that one as well? Sure. Um, yeah, this is a concern that comes up almost ubiquitously when we talk about removing dams. And I think it's it comes from a, a good place of concern for the wildlife. And so, you know, I, I always like to, to answer it. And it's, it's common to the point that I make a point of filming ducks and muskrats and, and uh, frogs and turtles and all of the species you listed there, utilizing newly restored areas post dam removal. Because sometimes people don't believe me when I say, they come right back and they love these places just as much as they loved the ponds before. Um, some of the warm water species that really thrive in impounded waters, you won't see them in the abundance that they are now, but um, catfish hornpout are pretty, pretty resilient. They can use a stream as well as, a, as an impoundment. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, there's temporary impacts to wildlife, but it rebounds pretty quick, you'd be amazed. Great, thank you guys for good answers. And um, another comment here from Leslie McGovern who lives at the top of the Indian Head River and owns over 600 feet of riverfront. She says, you know her, Steve. Um, they're eager to be involved and would welcome access to our property if that is of any help. Thank you for your offer. And we'll certainly be in touch. Um, will the river be st stocked post dam removal, Steve? Question. Uh, yes, it will be. I mean, it, it's a major recreational fisheries resource, um, and I anticipate it will be continued to be stocked um, for that purpose. Okay. Uh, next question is about the, can, would the mercury contamination have to be removed? Uh, surely it cannot be allowed to scour and wash down. Anybody want to take on contaminated sediments within the team here? Can you say that question again? I had, I actually am having trouble hearing you a bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Would the mercury contamination have to be removed? Surely it cannot be allowed to just, you know, wash downstream. Mm. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send that question to Neil, who is with Forsley Witten, um, and he, his team will be leading the sediment management part. Um, so, Neil, take it away. Sure, Sandra. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, Sam, you are very quiet, so I don't know, maybe you adjust where it is in front of your face or just talk really loud or something, but it's you're very hard to hear. I can also um, to read the rest of the questions if that's if I'm a little bit louder. You're much everyone else is is you know twice as loud as Sam is. Um, but anyway, uh, there are there are a few questions in the chat I see about mercury and contamination. And so I, I, I do want to say that that's a major part of, of this, right? So we're going to be doing some sampling, comparing it to standards, um, talking to regulatory agencies and coming up with a management plan that makes sense. And, and we've heard earlier that there's a number of options for how to do sediment management. You know, one of them is passive release. There's also actually active dredging. And um, if it's really bad, you have to take it to out-of-state landfills. Um, so... I will say we. Sh I will caution folks to jump to conclusions. Yes, there is a Superfund upside. Yes, there is uh, metals contamination, other contamination, particularly mercury. But the limited data that I have seen so far for these two impoundments does not uh, scream really bad conditions. Um, it's particularly the lower one, the Ledham's Ford one. None of the sediment sampling I've seen so far has any has exceeded any of the state uh, mass contingency plan thresholds for um, that would rule it out. The upper part, the cross street dam, a couple of the samples there were marginally above those thresholds. So we're gonna do a whole lot more sampling and come up with a plan that makes sense. But I, I do caution that we should not be jumping to conclusions to how this is gonna happen before we know all the information. Samantha, um... Could I could I jump back a little bit to that question about uh, downstream removal of sediments? Sure. Uh, and not only that one, but uh, um, there are habitats downstream uh, of the of the dams, and those habitats are currently being used by other species, in many cases for spawning. So when you release downstream sediments, uh, very often those areas are covered up. You don't have uh, sufficient flow to remove it. And uh, that's actually a, a case uh, that happened with the Jones River removal. Now, those fish conceivably could move upstream and spawn in, in, in the uh, newer uh, substrates, but we don't know that's gonna happen yet on the Jones. So that, that's an issue. Um, another issue uh, uh, with uh, habitat lost in the impoundments is uh, these impoundments, uh, especially in coastal Massachusetts, uh, provide a lot of habitat for alewives. Um, so when you remove that impoundment, you're actually losing an anadromous fish habitat. Uh, so it's a, you have to balance, balance the benefits and, and uh, you know, those, uh, those losses. Uh, that's, that's something that's often not mentioned, but should be made aware of. So you have to be careful when you lose that uh, uh, pond, lake, uh, still water habitat. Okay. Can you guys hear me any better now? Oh, yeah. Yes, I, loud and clear. <laughs> all right. I jacked up the mic here. <laughs> all right, cool. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your expertise in trying to address some of those mercury contamination and sediment issues. Um, somebody asked if we already know there is mercury and forage and factory pond, correct? Yes, that is true. We know that there is mercury and forage in factory pond. Um, as and Neil, I just wanted to correct you. We don't have a super fun site upstream, um, but we do have contaminate contamination. So yes, that's true. Um, next question. Okay, I think what are the impacts to the animals along the streams and ponds when you remove the dams? I feel like we addressed that. Um, so I hope that you feel that way too. Um, the 2022 fish count showed very few fish. Will the removal stimulate greater numbers of fish in the Indian Head River? Yes, well, that's the hope that um, by expanding habitats uh, for um, fish that we'll see increases, particularly for species that 
might not have been able to navigate the fish ladder. Um, but there's a lot of things at, at play here, right? Certainly climate change and um, other human impacts. So, um, but that definitely we've seen in other um, group dam removals, you know, maybe some others can speak to it, but that we have seen the return of, of fish. I can say in the third herring brook, we've seen the return of fish in areas where we had never seen them, you know, for 400 years because they were blocked. Presumably the more habitat area that they have, the more their populations can spawn. Um, yeah. And, can I jump in on that, Sam? Sure, sure, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the great examples of this is actually what Sandra talked about in her presentation, which is the Mill River. Um, in the 1920s, the Mill River was declared dead as a, basically a lost cause by the state that it was too polluted, too dammed up. There was no way we would ever recover the uh, migratory fish in that system. And after the last dam was removed in 2018 and a few years after that, we've been seeing over 10,000 herring return to that river every year. So removing these dams can have profound impacts on the rivers and the migratory fish that use them. Mm -hmm. cool. What can residents of these towns do to help ensure this project move, moves forward to the construction phase? Uh, well, I think just staying involved and, um, you know, again, we're not entirely sure what the um, design will be. So those are, you know, we're going to have a public meeting in the fall. So please come back. Um, please stay tuned to our emails. And um, I guess the other thing I would say is call your select board um, and, and let them know that you're supportive of this. Um, Obviously, like I said, we have a lot of questions to answer, like how much is it going to cost? Uh, how are we going to pay for this? Which, again, I think we have sources to pay for. Um, but definitely letting your um, elected officials know that you're in uh, support of, of pursuing this would be great. I can hear the lady talking. Great. <laughs> um, one of the next questions was, would dam removals lower water temperatures? And if so, by approximately how much would the temperature drop enough to support brook trout? I'll take a crack at that one. Um, I've actually been monitoring uh, water temperatures below the Elm Street Dam for over 15 years right now. And right now, summer temperatures are in the low 80s at times in that area. Based on what we've seen in some other dam removals, uh, you will see a substantial drop in temperature. Uh, maybe not enough to you know, fully sustain brook trout in the main stem, but it will definitely extend the period of time when they could utilize that main stem area. In ponds or streams with heavy groundwater influence, when you remove a small dam, you have dramatic impacts. The Child River Dam removal down in Falmouth, uh, we saw immediate a drop in temperatures of about 10 degrees in that system. And the brook trout are now spawning in the former impoundments. I don't anticipate that um, in this large river system, but we will see a substantial drop in water temperatures, I assume. Thanks, Steve. Um, next question was about sediment coming from the fireworks area. Um, not sure what the question is other than, you know, I guess, you know, is there sediment coming from the upstream, I guess, maybe? <laughs> is that the question? I mean, there's dams up there that are presumably holding back the majority of any sediments that are coming from there, but uh, yeah, is it possible? Yeah, go ahead. That the DEP is actually looking at uh, some sediment removal up in Factory Pond uh, right now as part of the fireworks cleanup. Um, so mm -hmm. they're addressing that issue somewhat right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course we want to see that remedied. <laughs> so that's all part of, of it, but it's not part of this particular project, but definitely a related issue, of course. Um, somebody asked if the dam removals would affect the area downstream at the canoe launch. Um, anybody got any thoughts about that? I think they're probably concerned about sediment, maybe. I mean, it can be shallow there at low tide and in a drought. 
<laughs> we're sort of scraping scraping the bottom but i i wouldn't presume so i think you know we would think that the sediment would flush out of the system um, and not necessarily be of any significance at that site but that's something that they'll look at through the models how much sediment is going to be transported and where where would it go anybody have any other thoughts about that from I the think, team uh, i think that uh if you look at the stream immediately below the dam below Ludham's Ford, that's uh if anything it's sediment stopped you have a very rocky bottom you don't have much gravel or anything between the the rocks and uh and this sediment starvation is uh comes because of the uh uh the sediment trap behind the dam so you don't have any natural transport of sediment coming through uh so I don't know what the outcome would be if the dam were taken out, but I, I imagine it would <clears throat> change that situation a little bit. But that would be a good thing, actually. Okay, terrific, thanks. Um, here's another question about uh, effect on other wildlife, ducks, birds, and whether there's being any studies done. Uh, mostly our studies would be about um, fish, uh, Anybody? I don't think there's any other studies that would be done. Yeah, we about ducks, ducks, birds, or otters. Survey, uh, you know, before and after these dam removals, I've done quite a bit of the post dam removal fish surveys recently. Uh, in terms of birds, a lot of that is done, you know, by birders and those sort of people. The types of birds that will utilize these areas will differ. Um, sometimes streams can be critical habitat in the winter when the ponds themselves will be frozen. When you have a free moving stream, sometimes you'll get more ducks and animals like that in the winter in these streams. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Um, somebody asks, with previous dam removals, have there been major improvements in navigation or is it more likely that water levels drop too far? What is your experience? Um, well, I'll just say, you know, clearly we're removing, when we remove the dam, the impoundment is lowered and it becomes a moving river again. Um, so, it, you know, at certain water levels, there should still be some navigation here, but those are some of the questions, I think, that will be discovered as we look at the the models. Uh, Nick, did yeah. you? Yeah. I just we just wanted to weigh in on that. Um, I've enjoyed uh, paddling some of these rivers after the dams have come out, including the Mill River uh, and the Shawshine River that that Sandra had mentioned and shown. And um, what's really exciting is that you have sort of a variety of paddling experiences through there, um, and it's uh, you. You know, you have to pay attention to the water flows, and it's passable at certain flows. It's a little bit too high and and too exciting at other flows. Um, but there were uh, I had a few you know amazing experiences of, of paddling the river, going through some some riffles and some pools, and then at slightly higher water, actually paddling through the floodplain when the water was over bank onto some forested floodplains, and paddling through those areas. Um, so uh certainly depending on the river uh depending on the water flows uh passage is um possible uh as opposed to trying to pull your boat up and over the dams that are and the barriers that are currently there thanks nick i'll also so, add that like in terms of improving navigability like some of these dams we've seen fill up with sediment where it's it's because like it's there's just too much sediment to even paddle around and um removing the dam definitely helps <laughs> fix that issue so mm -hmm. great uh somebody asked if there'd be any chance that they would stop stocking the river after dam removals to help the native species i guess that would be more for it uh, steve He's yeah, it would have to be a, a really big dramatic improvement, I think, to stop stocking that. The Indian Head is one of our major uh, stocked recreational trout fisheries. Uh, so I don't anticipate we'd stop the stocking unless it was a real dramatic improvement in the, you know, the wild brook trout populations. But this is a large river. And so I think that um, continued stocking 
that would be necessary in this particular system. Okay. Um, I think we've already asked this and answered this question about um, where do the fish go when the dams and ponds are removed? What ponds do they spawn in? Um, they, they just move to other parts of the rivers uh, to, to utilize that habitat. Um, somebody else who lives or owns property at the old Waterman Tack Factory at 360 Water Street in Hanover uh, says he's happy to help the effort. Hi, Bill. I know you. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, somebody asked if the removal of the Ludhamsford Dam would increase the temperature of the water downstream, thereby endangering. I think it's just the opposite. It actually, when we hold water back in a dam and have an impoundment or a pond, that water is getting hotter. And we've actually, as I think Steve already mentioned, measured that temperature differential um, from water coming out of the uh, impoundment. So it actually cools the stream. Uh, what will the tidal influence be? Well, the tide is influenced just to beneath that area. Um, I think that that is sort of the head of the tide, um, but it is something that we might want to take a look at as a as a team, as part of the um, engineering team. Anybody have any thoughts about will that be looked at as part of our hydrology? Because the tide does. So shockingly, the tide does come up there 12 or 13 miles up from the ocean. It, it's um, undammed all the way down. We have it. Um, it's a freshwater tidal influence, but the water does go up and down. Samantha, as, as I recall, there's a saltwater wedge that extends uh, upstream from Route 53. Uh, yeah, just a, yeah, yeah. I would say as you get into that the crotch area and the you know indian head it's pretty fresh but being still um moving up and down a couple feet with the tide but it, it, there's actual salt water entering uh as a wedge oh. below the, the uh, fresh water that extends uh i'm pretty sure past that big rock that's just in in the middle of the stream above 53. yeah uh, and you uh, of course you do get rise and fall of the fresh water above that as the tide uh, mm -hmm. comes in and uh, that will obviously uh, increase and decrease with the tidal stage. Right. Um. But this, I know from uh, shad fishing on the river below the dam that there's a, there's a point, uh, I want to say probably about 150 yards down from the dam where uh, the tidal influence ends. Um, there's a there's a long pool uh, that uh, uh, the tide probably only come, it comes up maybe at that point it only comes up like about a foot or so or, or a foot and a half. But beyond that, because of the incline of the river, it, it doesn't go any further than that. Really. So there's a, a section well before the dam that's not tidal mm -hmm. so and i i don't think it would be affected at all by the removal of the dam don't see how that would happen yes well, until the sea level rises right warren oh well yeah all right that's that's something we'll look at as well in our in our Terrific. survey and our in our analyses um because if it does affect this area, then it will affect water levels and we'll want to consider that. Right. It's part of that hydrologic analysis that y'all do. Um, somebody asked about would the brown trout and rainbow trout that are stocked have any chance to take hold in the main stem post dam removal? Uh, uh, Steve? Po possibly the brown trout uh, may reproduce on occasion, but we really haven't noticed any uh, self-sustaining brown trout populations here in these rivers. I mean, we have found reproduction um, in some of the larger rivers like the Weir River in Hingham. I've come across small brown trout on occasion, but they don't seem to maintain their populations here. Um, and the rainbow trout don't uh, reproduce at all in this area of the state. The waters are too acidic for that. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Steve. And then uh, somebody asked if the American shad that are already in the Indian Head River, what is the anticipated change to their population numbers after dam removal? Well, I actually um, wanted to invite James Garner to speak a little bit about shad. He's been doing a, a, a DNA study on the river and has some information he could share about the, about the shad. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me. Um, I've been working with the, the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries to do an environmental DNA study, um, both upstream and downstream of this, of this dam. And environmental DNA, for those who don't know, is just taking um, genetic material from organisms that shed it uh, naturally and, and collecting it in water samples, um, uh, filtering it, extracting it, and being able to, to detect the presence of those organisms um, without ever having to see them. Um, and so we did an environmental DNA study, both, like I said, upstream and downstream of the Lottoms Fork Dam. And um, our goal was to calibrate the concentration of DNA that we found in our water samples to ongoing um, Division of Marine Fisheries electrofishing surveys. Um, so to, to see if we could use environmental DNA as a proxy to estimate population abundance. Um, and our study results were actually pretty good. We had a really positive correlation. And um, it turns out, sorry, my dog is running around. Um, it turns out that eDNA might be a good metric to estimate abundance um, in, this, in this space. But more interesting than that, when we looked at the upstream portion of the dam, we did not find any significant evidence of American shad upstream of the London Sword Dam, which is um, a very um, compelling finding, if you ask me. Uh, where we found a lot of evidence uh, downstream. Right. I have, so, I have to, excuse me, Samantha, I have to cut in there. Yes. We have, this was back in the, would have been in the 70s or 80s. We did find evidence of shad above the dam. And mm -hmm. uh, we had placed a fike net at the exit end of the, uh, the dam, uh, of the fish ladder, mm -hmm. and found at least one shad there. Now, obviously, that doesn't improve. Uh, that doesn't prove uh, efficient passage, but uh, it is was possible for those fish to uh, to get up above the dam in some numbers. Mm -hmm. Now it, it could be that uh, the uh, uh, in a, inefficient uh, maintenance of the fishway or regulation of the fishway could prevent them from going up now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I can only say that back then. Mm -hmm. It was passable by shed to some extent. Mm -hmm. And I'm by no means saying that uh, shad definitely cannot make it upstream. I just said, I'm just saying that we found no compelling evidence sure. uh, with uh, the environmental DNA study um, mm -hmm. of them being upstream mm -hmm. um, in 2021. Right, right. So I guess, um, again, the hope would be that by removing these obstructions, that there would be much more efficient uh, passage that would be allowed. Uh, and that again, their their population populations would be improved because they would increase their spawning habitat. Um, so I think that's generally the thinking around around it. But I did want to share some of the more recent um, findings. Um, and then I think we're almost. Done. Somebody else asked: Are there plans to remove other dams upriver, i.e., the Forge Pond Dam? Um, we're really just concentrating our efforts right now on these two, um, State Street, Cross Street, which is like a bump in the road, really. And then, of course, the Ludhams Ford. And so uh, that's not to say that we wouldn't look upstream um, at some point. But at this point, we're just looking at these two. Um, that's what the scope of this work is. Um, and I think that'll be enough <laughs> on our plates <laughs> for, for the time being. Um, but you know, if if these two dams are removed, then then it may foster additional dam removals upstream. We'll have to see. Um, just trying to make sure I've kind of grabbed everybody's pertinent questions. Um, somebody asked how many people are on the Zoom call. There was around eighty eight. We're at sixty nine now. We're losing some folks probably since they're about an hour and 15 minutes into the presentation. Um, somebody asked to date, has there been any recorded fish wildlife kills from high temperature contamination and droughts? What were the species? 
Um, I'm not sure that we have any large scale fish or wildlife kills. I can tell you, I personally have witnessed brook trout dying um, downstream of the dam um, because of high temperatures in the stream. So just, um, and it was kind of tough because we had kids with us and they didn't understand what was going on. We, I mean, it was a lesson. We got to teach them about temperature um, and oxygen. But as far as I know, there's not been any large uh, fish kills. Steve, do you have any? Um, there's occasional fish kills, you know, of trout and things like that. But, uh, you know, most of these um, rivers have warm water species that are pretty tolerant of real high temperatures. The brook trout will try to survive and they'll migrate up into those small tributaries, which is why it's so important to, you know, do these dam removals is to allow species like the brook trout that are very temperature intolerant to migrate to those areas of refuge where they can survive. Yes, and so we actually um, did a project some time ago with the town of Hanover to create more refugia for brook trout in the Iron Mine Brook. Um, there was a culvert that at low flows would have prevented iron, um, prevented the brook trout from being able to seek that cold temperature, cold water in the in the Iron Mine Brook. And through um, some work with the town of Hanover and Trout Unlimited, we were able to restore that brook so that fish could hide in there when it's hot. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the rest are just really comments from people about um, somebody thinks the dam is ugly and would like to see it removed. She thinks it's an eyesore. Um, somebody was talking about the, the ducks and how great a habitat it is uh, for them as a river. Um, and I think, I think that's it. So again, I'll just throw it back to Becky to kind of close us out. I want to let her wrap us up. Yeah, so thank you again for attending and thank you for all of um, the feedback and answers. It's great to have such a, a big panel with a broad breadth of knowledge, um, able to respond to some of these questions directly and have so much previous experience to draw on. So I think that was really helpful for me and hopefully it was helpful for the attendees as well. Um, so I'll send out a link to the recording to all of those who are attending. That will also have my email address. If you want to share the link with anybody who you think might be interested. Um, and again, share any other organizations, groups, specific people that you think that we should be talking to over the coming months. Uh, we'd be happy to do that. If you're interested in being part of a walk or site visit this summer, or you have a community event that you think would be helpful for uh, us to attend, please let me know. Um, and again, you can respond to that follow-up email with all that information. But uh, this is a great first start. You know, we don't really have any answers yet. We have a lot, a ton of experience here in this panel, and we have a path forward. Um, and we'll see what kind of answers that we we get in September and have another larger conversation about what to do next. Thank you, Sam. Just shared my email address in the um in the QA box. I don't know that everyone can see that. If you can't, Becky at nsrwa.org. So thanks yeah. again for all your participation and for being here and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks so much, Becky. Thank you, team. Bye, Thank you all. Good night.